I haven't posted anything here in a while, and that's because I've been busy working on a new public art installation. Now that it's all done, I thought I'd walk you through the process. As background, I came at this from an unusual direction. I had no formal art experience when I got started in public art. I'm just a weirdo with computer science degrees who found he really enjoyed working on big installations for Burning Man. So this is just what I figured out through trial and error. If there is some secret fast-tracked application process they teach you about at the end of an MFA, I, I just don't know it. I'm also somewhat unusual in that I always do the vast majority of my own fabrication work. A lot of artists contract that out, particularly for larger projects. The project management side is my least favorite part of the process, though, so I'm going to stick with getting my hands dirty. In the end, the draw for me is getting paid to work on the kind of stuff I'd be doing anyway. Having a real budget can be downright magical when it comes to buying new tools. Best of all, I don't even have to worry about the storage for the final result. Barring some kind of special invitation, public art usually starts with a call. These are posted on local municipal websites, often picked up by specialty aggregators. Obviously, the less competition you have, the better your chances are, so I find it worthwhile to regularly browse about a dozen sites. Many calls are limited by geographic region, and generally speaking, committees are always going to prefer a local artist. At my level of experience, I haven't found applying to large national calls successful, so I mostly concentrate on the Pacific Northwest. Calls come in two types, RFPs, requests for proposals, and RFQs, requests for qualifications. An RFP is asking for an actual specific proposal. At least some sketches will usually be required, and full renderings are of course even better. You're doing all the high-level design work ahead of time here and hoping to impress the committee with your great idea. These tend to be for smaller projects under around $30,000. And that's good because they are asking you to do free design work here. But an artist without much of a portfolio needs to get started somewhere, so this seems like a decent compromise. With an RFQ, you're not submitting an idea, you're submitting yourself, usually in the form of a CV and portfolio. The committee will then select four artists from whom they'd like to see a full proposal. Those artists are paid a nominal amount and do the initial design work. The committee then selects their favorite to be fully funded and developed. This is a better deal for the artists, obviously, but you need an existing body of work to be considered. RFQ contracts can get very large. Mid-six figures for airport renovations are pretty common, and I've seen ones up into seven figures. Not that I've ever come close to getting something that big, but it sounds like a nice racket to be in. At the moment, though, I haven't had a lot of luck with RFQs. I've only gotten to the second stage a handful of times, and only one of my four permanent installations was through an RFQ process. Assuming the call is an RFP, my best advice is to put as much effort as possible into your design renderings. In my experience, you're a lot more likely to wow them with an interesting idea if you're not relying on their imagination too much. This is your chance, particularly as a beginner, to really stand out. If they've provided a picture of the location, composite your rendering into it to make it even easier for them to imagine. I use Blender for my renderings. It's uh, not always the easiest thing to work with, but it sure is powerful and free. And the UI is a lot better than it used to be. Don't get too carried away though. Always be asking yourself, can this actually be made? It's easy to render any wild thing, but if all goes well, someone is actually going to have to make it real. This is where hands-on fabrication experience is really valuable. Keep in mind what the city or organization is willing to provide. Often, but definitely not always, they will be willing to put in the pad themselves, preferring to have their own people do that kind of work. They also might be willing to bring in their own heavy equipment to hoist the pieces into place. In my limited sample, I'd say this is the case about half the time. But if not, you're going to have to pay to get the pad put in, and that can be quite expensive. And you might also have to rent a forklift, but that's just good fun. It's amazing what you can have delivered sight unseen with just a credit card. Other potential surprise costs are insurance and engineering. Cities will often require that you carry insurance for the installation process, which usually costs me around $1,000 for the year. They also might require a structural engineer to look at the design and sign off on it. And even if they don't require that, you absolutely should do this anyway if it involves heavy bits suspended over people's heads. No one wants to be another Christo. 
public art leads a very rough life, so keep that in mind for your design, particularly the material selection. It will get climbed on, and it will get graffitied. That's just facts. It also needs to stand up to all weather conditions with minimal maintenance. And by minimal, I mean basically zero. Paint and even powder coating is pretty iffy. They will eventually crack, and if it's just mild steel under there, the rust will just keep expanding. If it's thin sheet, it wouldn't take long for it to get eaten all the way through, depending on the climate. A lot of committees will be leery of paint for this reason, unless it's over a more durable material like stainless steel or aluminum. As for uncoated materials, you're left with a pretty limited palette. Stainless steel. Pricey, but gorgeous. Hard to work with, except for welding where it flows like butter. Tricky to work with cleanly, often developing little spots of rust over time due to alloy contamination. This isn't a structural concern, but it can be a significant aesthetic issue. Weathering steel. Widely known by the brand name Core 10, this is any alloy of steel designed to develop a rusty patina, but then stop rusting. Unlike in normal steels, this rust actually protects it from further corrosion, much like how aluminum works. Fairly cheap and easy to work with, though I've always had trouble getting nice clean welds on it. The rust can leave unsightly stains on materials under it, particularly concrete, so keep that in mind. And you need to remove the mill scale if you want a nice even patina to form. Aluminum. Great corrosion resistance, pain in the ass to weld without what I'd consider specialty equipment. That is, equipment I don't have. It can also be cast, a very interesting option that is often overlooked. Bronze. Usually found in public art in the form of castings. Very pretty, and you can develop a range of patina colors on it with different chemicals. The main drawback is that copper alloys are expensive. This is a problem for your budget, but also for long-term security. Large bronze sculptures occasionally disappear in the middle of the night, and that is something your funding agency will want to consider. Glass. Not something I've worked with, but I'd like to. Needs to be thick, of course, but it can be used in some really interesting ways. Stone and concrete. None of my designs which use these have ever been selected, so I haven't had a chance to work with them. But, you know, it's stone and concrete. They can handle being outside pretty well. Wood. It can be done with great results but I'd expect the committee to be a bit leery of it. And that's kind of it for public art materials. Embrace the restriction, like a sonnet. The project I just finished was for Liberty Lake, Washington, on the other side of the state from where I now live and just a few miles from where I grew up. And to be completely transparent here, my parents have been involved in civic life there for a long time, so my name wasn't unknown to the committee. That certainly wasn't the case for any of my other installations, though. In January, the city put out an RFP for a sculpture based on the Liberty Lake Together logo. This was a very open-ended call, without even the final location being specified. The budget was also on the low end for permanent sculptural pieces, capped at $10,000, though with the possibility left open for somewhat more given the right proposal. Whenever possible, I like to walk around a location before starting work on the design. It is possibly the most pretentious thing I do in a life not short of pretensions, but wandering a site trying to feel its aesthetic vibe has always felt really valuable to me. Unfortunately, that wasn't an option this time, as the location wasn't specified and it being a bit far for a casual day trip. After a site visit, my normal design process for developing a proposal, assuming no ideas have jumped out at me, is to open up Blender and start playing with shapes. In this case, I started by tracing the Together logo. Something about the central head shape spoke to me, so I tried revolving it about the z-axis, making it a bulb. It looked so botanical, I turned the arms into two sets of leaves. They looked a bit blank, so I added some veins in the forms of thin rods to be welded on, with the idea that real vines might eventually grow up them. I called this growing together and priced it at 9500 I usually try not to be exactly at the budget cap. I also made a second bonus proposal, with a more direct extrusion of the logo shape, called Enmesh Together for 15000 Here the head would be suspended in a thick stainless steel lattice. I've been trying to work this lattice design into proposals for five years now, because I'm kind of obsessed with it. It's my take on a Pinrose tiling using rhombus tiles. Each tile is randomly selected to be visible or not based on Gaussian distribution from a given axis or point. I really love the result, but so far no one has wanted to pay me to use it, and this was no exception. I submitted my proposals on March 29, and on March 12th I was told my Growing Together submission had been selected. The contract was then signed by the beginning of June. Later that month I drove over to look at potential locations. 
we ended up deciding on Rocky Hill Park, along a low ridge line in a grassy field that didn't see a lot of use. In the process, the design was altered to have the flowers running more linearly along the ridge, instead of grouped in a circle. This kind of fine-tuning is pretty common, and I'd suggest you really embrace it. Public art needs to be part of its surroundings to be successful. It's not just a painting hanging on a blank wall. It also has a lot of stakeholders. Not just the city and committee, but also the people who live and work near the installation. For my visitor installation in Vancouver, the local business group expressed concerns that litter might end up collecting on the manhole cover. Not an unreasonable concern, so I modified the design to increase the angle at which it was mounted. I also went over again later in the summer to talk to the facilities people who would be installing the mounting pads. We decided on making them two feet deep, with rebar extending below that by several feet. I provided a set of plywood templates with the mounting anchors already bolted on, so that I knew they would match the bolt holes in the final pieces. In this case, I was just drilling them on my mill, but on other projects with more complicated mounting plates that have been water jet cut, I had a second one cut out of plywood at the same time for this purpose. Trust me, you really, really want the holes to fit the mounting bolts on the first try. I got to a slow start on fabrication, due to a cross-country train trip to spend a week boating on the Erie Canal with my family. In July, I started prototyping. I wanted to try something different for the large weathering steel leaves. Normally I'd have something like this water jet cut, but the cost of that adds up. So I thought instead I'd buy a good plasma cutter and do the job myself. I also wanted to try to save money on how I strip the mill scale off the steel. I've had pieces media blasted before, and that works, but again, it's not cheap. And even just moving sheets of this size is a real cost, requiring that I rent a truck each time. Instead, I wanted to try the vinegar bath technique I'd seen on Michael Cthulhu videos. So I tried it on a small test section of weathering steel overnight, and it worked. What remained of the scale was easily wiped away with a rag, exposing the nice, clean, easily rusted steel underneath. Later, the new plasma cutter arrived, and I convinced myself I could make reasonably accurate cuts following a template. So everything was all go by the end of July. Time to spend some real money. The steel arrived in early August, and I got to work. I'd used a plasma cutter before, but only a cheap little one. This one can cut up to about 5 eighths cleanly, and I've managed up to a full inch allowing for a hideously ugly cut. I made templates for each size of leaf, printed them on a large format printer, glued them to some plywood, and then cut them out. These were undersized by 0.2 inches to allow for the offset caused by the width of the torch head. After cutting, each one had to be cleaned up with an angle grinder. I'm still learning how to reliably get good clean cuts with the plasma cutter, so this took more effort than it really should have. Cut and cleaned up, the leaves were ready to have the mill scale removed. To do this, I made a giant bathtub in the outer shop from a tarp and wood blocking, and I filled it with vinegar. Luckily, I soon realized that big box hardware stores carry 30% acetic acid for cleaning purposes, as that was much easier and much cheaper than relying on grocery store supplies. The vinegar bath did work, but it was messy and very labor-intensive and just generally kind of a nightmare. Each piece still had to be scrubbed to remove the mill scale, and on this size that took a lot more elbow grease. And it also tended to leave me pretty soaked from running the hose like this. Laying them down in the bath without splashing was nearly impossible, and holes formed in the tarp, probably due to the violence of inserting and removing the larger leaves. This made a huge corrosive mess. But that's why I did it in the outer shop, I guess. Unless you're really tight for cash, I don't think I would recommend this method at this scale. The bulbs were each made of 16 gores, cut from 14 gauge stainless steel. I tried doing this with the plasma cutter, and I did manage to make the gores for the large bulb that way. But I quickly realized that they were just too imperfectly shaped, a problem which had only become more significant for the smaller bulbs. I cleaned up the large gores by marking them with a paintbrook template of the correct size, but I decided to get the smaller gores water jet cut. The gores needed to be bent to match a specific curve, for which I made a template out of plywood. First I ran them through a small roller to get the general curve, then I manually tweaked each one to match the template as closely as possible. Like everything else here, easy enough to say, slow to actually do for all 64 gores. With those formed, I could tack them up into four gore quarters. At this point, I took the time to cut down the sides as needed to make sure they had a perfect 90 degree angle. The error was always going to stack up on something like this, and the earlier I could take that out, the less obvious it would be in the final bulb. The worst result would be to have it all concentrated in the last weld when joining two halves, at which point that joint might be several centimeters out of alignment. Far too large an error to easily hide. 
The quarters were then combined into 8 gore halves, and finally into complete 16 gore bulbs. They mostly went together easier than I expected. There were a couple tricky parts though, particularly on the smallest bulb, whose curvature made it very hard to clamp effectively. Eventually I figured out that I could weld on temporary tabs, and then use a C-clamp to pull it together. This worked really well. With the bulbs fully tacked together, they could be welded. And then ground, and ground, and ground. This took well over a week and went through uncounted flap disks. For the record, the mixed packs of 40 on Amazon are complete trash. Do not waste your money on them. The 40 grit disks in those would literally only last about 90 seconds, or maybe a quarter of a single seam on the medium-sized bulbs. I celebrated getting the grinding done by improving my grinder disk storage a bit. I still have the drawer of random stuff, of course, but it'll be nice having all the main types. Flap disks in 40, 60, 80, and 120 grit, grinding wheels, and cutoff disks, quickly and easily accessible. Finally, it was time for some machining. Each flower has a shaft of Schedule 40 stainless steel pipe, which is welded to a half-inch flange for mounting. In the days before the plasma cutter, I would have burned through dozens of cutoff disks trying to cut octagonal blanks. Now I can just cut circles directly and mount them on the lathe for turning. Nothing complicated, just rather slow given the large diameter, and the initial cut was interrupted and through some nasty hard oxides, chewing up the inserts quickly if I wasn't careful. The central hole was bored out to fit the pipe, but for this the smaller bases were mounted at an angle on the faceplate, so those flowers would lean a bit. A bit of trig gave me the height of these standoffs against the faceplate to give the desired angle for each. I wanted the junction between the shaft and the leaves to be as clean as possible. To do this, I planned to weld the leaves together, then hide the weld by slotting the shaft and sliding it down over, to be welded directly to the base. Slotting the shafts presented a few challenges. Cutting very long slots in stainless steel without flood coolant isn't fun. I took it very slowly, but still went through a bunch of decent carbide end mills. After slotting the smallest pipe, I realized it was best not to cut all the way through. This released the internal stresses of the pipe, resulting in deformations that made it very hard to get the other slots cut. It also made the process faster, though that is a relative term, since the largest still took several evenings to get done. After the work on the mill, I cut the rest of the slot open with an angle grinder. It wasn't hard to avoid touching the nicely milled upper edge, so the final cut still looked really sharp. Another question was how to index the cuts to keep them all 90 degrees apart. I ended up clamping a bit of angle iron to the end of the pipe, and using a level on it each time I rotated it. This worked well enough for these purposes. Later I remembered I had a digital inclinometer, and that at least was readable from a distance, greatly speeding up this fiddly process. This all worked for the small and medium pipes, but the large pipe presented a new problem. It was too long. I had to move the mill out from the wall, then support the far end of the pipe on the stand. The slot itself was longer than the X-travel of my mill, so I had to reposition the pipe to get the last 10 centimeters cut. Luckily the needed precision wasn't super high, but still a pain. I guess I just need a bigger mill. Finally, it was time to assemble. I did everything with the smallest flower first, to learn from mistakes when it was easiest. I had a lot of problems getting the shaft all the way down over the leaves, which I solved for the small one with the use of large hammers, but later solved for real by changing my process. Instead of welding the leaves fully together, I would just heavily tack them at the top end. Now when the shaft was slid over them, the lower sides could shift around a bit to fit the shaft optimally. With the shaft temporarily in place, the base plate was slid over to make sure it fit in this configuration, and then the lowest edges of the leaves were tacked together. Then the base and shaft were removed and the leaves could be fully welded up. This worked great on the medium-sized flowers, but it was definitely a struggle scaled up to large flower, but I made it work in the end. Next, it was time to add the veins. I sketched out the shape on the welding table and started cutting sections of rod and bending them to shape, then tacking them together. Slow, but it sped up considerably once I started assembly lining the process. These were held off the surface of the leaf with a series of little studs. Fiddly, but not difficult. Finally, the bulbs could be added. I saved these for last to minimize the risk of damaging them. If they got dented in, for instance, it would be extremely difficult to fix at this point. This went smoothly for the smaller flowers, just requiring a lot of detail work to clean up the top joint, which would be visible. For the large flower, this first meant flipping it around in place, a fun exercise all in itself. It ended up being more stable though than I expected. The bulb was heavy enough to make holding it a challenge. In fact, I dropped it at one point, denting the lower edge where it hit the leaves. I ended up adding these petal thing details to hide the transition. I was reasonably happy with them, at least their upper half. 
And then it was all done, except for a couple hours of cleaning up everything with flap disks and wire wheels. Installation is always the most stressful part of a project. It's a deadline involving other people, after all. Everything has to work, and there's usually an audience standing around for when things don't work. This time, though, they said he did offer the use of some heavy equipment, which would greatly simplify things. Unfortunately, I didn't have anything like that on my end. I did have my little gantry crane, which was more than strong enough for the task, but I realized at the last minute that the flatbed truck I'd rented was three inches too wide to fit underneath the crane. I had also ordered some plate clamps for use in the hoisting. Unfortunately, those were delayed. They weren't going to arrive until the night before installation. Since I definitely wanted them for unloading, I decided it was best to try and load as much as possible during the day, so that when the plate clamps finally arrived, I could head straight out. The solution I ended up with was a bit janky, but it did actually feel solid in practice. The cargo strap around the leaves is wedged tight because of the outward slope of the leaves. This could be done just above the CG, and ended up working well. I managed to back the corner of the flatbed under the piece, and then lower it down. Luckily, while very heavy, it wasn't too hard or scary to walk it back manually into place. The others went much easier, and it was all ready to go. The drive across the state, a bit under 300 miles, went smoothly, if slowly. This was the farthest I've ever had to deliver a sculpture, and this is getting a bit outside my core competencies. But the straps all held just fine, something I stopped to check out of paranoia about every hour. The next morning, it was H hour, and it all went really easily. Smoothest install I've done, so maybe I'm learning. The smaller flowers were all placed by hand. I did the smallest myself early on, and then when some city people showed up, they helped me get the next two in place. By this point, the front end loader had arrived, and we could hoist the large flower. We used the plate clamps I had been waiting for, and I'm very glad I did wait for them, because they worked a treat. They're going to be a great addition to my rigging kit. The large flower was then driven over to its pad. We wrestled into place, uh, which was a bit awkward, but the bolt holes fit the first time, so no worries there. It really was a very easy install. After bolting down the pieces, it was all done. It took under two hours, and a lot of that was waiting for the loader and chatting with city people. They were digging a trench to install lighting when I left, and we'll be adding some concrete curbing and landscaping around the pieces over the next few weeks. A slightly faster drive across the street and I was home, and the project was done. Overall, this was a pretty smooth and straightforward project. I got to a later start than I should have, and that's on me. The steel orders all took longer than I wanted them to due to the supply chain issues, and they also all cost a lot more than expected. Financially, this was not a winner for me, but at least I got the new plasma cutter out of it. I knew that would be iffy going in, and decided it was worth the risk to have an installation with connections close to where I grew up. And let's be honest, I would have been doing something expensive in the shop if not for this, and not getting paid even a little bit for it. I'm still a long way from making a living at this kind of thing, and maybe that's just as well. I'm pretty happy with it being a hobby that has an occasional payoff, instead of a constant hunt for contracts that just fills me with anxiety to even think about. It's like when I wonder if I could make shop videos for a Patreon or something. In the end, I think I value my freedom more. I really like being able to put up content about whatever weird thing is obsessing me at the moment, without having to worry too much about keeping the algorithm happy. Speaking of, I'm hoping to get back to philosophical reactions this week, as well as starting to work on some videos about the infrastructure terrorism I've been doing this year. Plus, I think it's finally time to make the thumper I've been dreaming of for years. Stay tuned!